Romance at a glance. Uh huh. Romance at a glance. What you say? Romance at a glance. Go ahead, girl. Well, hello, dear listeners, and welcome back to Romance at a Glance, Authors at a Glance. Today, we have for you suspense romance queen, Suzanne Brockman. If you are into the suspense genre, you have read her books. If you're not, you should get on it and read her book. She is an incredible writer, writes such amazing worlds. Navy SEALs, hello, Drop Dead Gorgeous People are in these books, not just for their muscles, but also for their hearts. We had so much fun talking about her. We talked about everything from her writing, the early days of romance, like she used to not be able to use penis in books, and now she can just do whatever she wants, about how hard she worked to get more diversity, more LGBTQ people in her books, and how hard it was at the beginning, and how every book she just kept putting more and more in, more and more in, and forcing them to tell her no, and how you know, they weren't even sure if anyone would ever buy her books with Jules Cassidy, um, who was the first character in her series who had his own love interest, who was a gay character. They had a subplot, and then later they had their own book. And the publisher wasn't even sure anyone would ever buy it. And it did. It ended up being one of her most successful characters, most successful books. So that just goes to show you, people love great writing. They love love. Love is love. Love is love, people. I love her so much. She was one of my OG romance novel reads. I tore through the series every time a new one came out. I was one of those people at Barnes and Noble or Borders buying her hardcover copies, which is why she is a New York Times bestseller many, many times over. She's a titan, you guys. She's a titan of the industry. We were so thrilled to talk to her, so thankful that she said yes and squeezed us in. Guys, we also got into her RWA 2018 acceptance award speech for her lifetime achievement. And she went straight savage and it was awesome. If you have a quick moment to pause this podcast and go to our website, romanceataglance.com forward slash podcast forward slash Suzanne dash Brockman dash interview. Go there right now, read or watch her acceptance speech. It is legendary. Literally gave me the chills. We're so excited to break it down. You guys, if you're authors out there, this is a great episode to listen to. She gives so many amazing tips about how to write characters that are different from you, why you should be writing characters that are different from you, researching, you know, what kind of things she uses for that type of research, what kind of resources, and could not recommend Suzanne Brockman as a person and as an author more highly. Let's get it popping. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much for being here because I have been freaking out since you agreed to be on the show. You're my OG romance novel that I ever read. My okay. mom was a big fan, handed them over, and I have read all the books that you have written since. So this is a huge treat. Well, thank you. It's a, I'm really happy to be here. So thank you for inviting me. First of all, I just want to say that Navy, Navy SEALs seems like an inspired choice. What kind of drew you to the Navy SEALs? Um, you know, it was, it was actually, I was early in my career, right? So I was the writing careers of, of um, well, Nora Roberts, for one, um, authors who started out in category romance and then moved into mainstream. So it seemed to me um, when I was a, a, a youngster back in the early 90s, uh, my, my first book was published in 93, right? So, okay, so I'm writing furiously. I'm trying to make a living doing this. I've you know, got two kids at home, you know, like it's, it's just, it's, it's insanity. And, um, and so I'm, I'm thinking, okay, so here are these incredible authors who have, who have taken this path before me. And what did they do? Not, not how did they write, but, but what, what choices did they make in, in where they were published? Um, uh, and what, what types of books did they write to, to kind of catapult them into, um, into uh, this, you know, into Romance Landia, you know, into, into people's, you know, kind of conscience. Like- yeah, yeah, like this kind of collective, yeah, exactly. That's those are the words I was looking for. But um, so so I was I looked at their careers and and so okay, the, so a lot of people started writing category romances, and so that's that's where I targeted all my time and attention. And um, and what did they do? They wrote um, continuity series. So if you're talking about series romance, it's a series within within the, the lines. So I was writing for the um, silhouette intimate moments line. And, and the, really the funny thing is that I had, um, I figured I was a rom-com author, 
but my first book that I sold to Harlequin Silhouette was Suspense. So um, that first year after I was published, I, I, I submitted rom-com after rom-com and they were like, no, 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 you can't write that. You must write Suspense. And I'm like, I'm a suspense author. Okay, let's go. <laughs> and so I was looking, I was looking for a mini series hook. So it was, you know, and I and and I saw, you know, Nora had done, you know, the the ten brothers of the McGills or something. You know, I mean, there, there, there was a lot of um, series that um, that surrounded family, and and that had been done an awful lot. But it's 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 just it's a great connection right you, you know and you can always you can continue the series because you can have like an illegitimate sibling show up and you know it's like oh, wait there's one more but um but I, but I authors had done that and I didn't want to do that so I was looking for something just a little bit different that would connect a series of books and um and and a really good friend of mine um a guy named Eric Rubin um went to the dentist. I always say I write about Navy SEALs because my friend Eric went to the dentist and, um, and people are like, Oh, <laughs> while he was in the dentist's office, this was back in the day of printed magazines. Um, he picked up a copy of Newsweek and they, it was an ancient like years old copy. And it had an article on, um, on the SEAL teams and on Bud's training in particular. And, um, and he read it and he came home and he had was like Novocaine mouth, you know, and he called me up and he could barely speak. And he was like, Suze, Navy SEALs, this is what you've been looking for. And, um, and just, you know, to, so, so this was 93, 94, somewhere in there, maybe early 95. And, um, and I like, I jumped before the internet, like, really, I jumped into my car, went to the library and I sat, I remember sitting in the stacks with the magazines, found that article in Newsweek, read it. And, and knew because I um, I have I, I've always been a World War II history buff, so I have this great respect for the men and women of the military, and so and I loved reading military nonfiction, and so knowing that about myself, and then what I read in that article about the Navy SEALs, I knew that the research was going to be awesomely fun, um, and that and and I also thought okay, I think it was something like. I can't remember. I can't remember what the number was, but it was like something like two thousand six hundred and eighty-nine active duty Navy SEALs in the United States right now. And I thought oh, I can write a book for every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, truly a series that will never end. And um, so, yeah. So that's that's really how it happened. You know, I've just like just read it, really connected with the idea, read the article, um, then started researching wildly and really um, like really loving what I found out about the type of, of, um, of people who, who make the choice to first of all, join the military and then, and then attempt to become Navy SEALs. Cause it's, it's, and it is attempt. I mean, it's, yeah. it's hard to do that. And, and it just, and I just thought, wow, these, these guys are really smart. Most of them have really great senses of humor and, um, and they're just driven by something that I could really relate to. And, and I just, you know, so that, that the rest is history, you know, we kind of wrote one and then just kept going. Did you, know, you, so, so well, you, oh, you, you threw me back really quickly because I had for, totally forgotten this, but I dated a guy for a brief time who was training to become a Navy SEAL. He'd already like attempted it and failed like a, like a, the first tier of it. Um, and he was just too skinny. <laughs> I remember it. Like he didn't have enough muscle mass. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was intense. I, def I remember that. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, I mean, the real, you know, I'm writing romance novels, right? So you get the, so it's the fantasies of the Navy SEAL. I mean, Navy SEALs traditionally make terrible partners. Oh my God, they're they're just, it's insane how often it ends in divorce and, and uh, you know, but, but hey, it's a romance novel and we can kind of, we can, we can imagine the- We can dream. Yeah, yeah. The, the, Bend reality the, to our will. It's, it's really, uh, it's way more um, of a fantasy thing about about that kind of commitment, and then you know, because and it's also that idea that if you can, if 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 you can connect romantically with somebody who's that committed, that like that that that's a really nice fantasy too. <laughs> yeah, like that that commitment will transfer to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that a nice kind of. In, so in that kind of perfect bubble of, of happily ever after, you know, yeah. 
Nice. I always I always think that romance novels are really great because they end right at that happily ever after. There's been a couple of books where I told Bridget, I was like, if this book continued, they'd be divorced and mm. this would be bad. <laughs> You know, at the same time, though, um, it, when because I wrote well, well, in my second SEAL series, the Troubleshooter series, I was able to really um, dig into some of the to show relationships as they as they grew over time, and I, because that's something that that I that as a as I got older myself, um, just really fascinated me about about what love is and what love can become and that the, 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 the necessity for a really strong friendship at the foundation of a romantic relationship. And, and, and so, so to then to be able to take characters who found their, their romance novel HEA in book one and, and show them what's happening with them in book five and then 10 and then 16 is just, it's just a kind of a really cool thing to be able to do as a, as a romance novelist, because we don't often get to talk about that. You know, we really, again, you just like, it's, it's like, you know, the big Hollywood kiss or, you know, and then, and, and yeah, they lived happily ever after maybe. (laughs) Do you map out the series ahead of time? Like, so when you came up with the troubleshooters, did you think like, okay, I know we're going to focus on Tom's SEAL team first and those are going to be the core and then we're going to branch. Like, did you kind of already plot out or did you just write and then everyone kept showing back up and all these funny moments came to you? Yeah, I'm a plotter. So yeah. So I knew when I wrote, I knew I didn't want Tom and Kelly to get married at the end of The Unsung Hero because I wanted it to come back and bite Kelly in particular in the ass. And and um, and that that is a plot, that is a plot point in in um in one of the later books when when she's not married and so they're she's they need to kind of get married so she'll be kind of legally able to it 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 it, it was a kind of a fun thing to have to then show what their wedding in in a kind of looked like at that point um uh, so I knew that going in. I knew I I knew that there was going to be a situation where Tom had to leave the seals and was going to break off and, and form this uh, civilian group. Um, I knew, um, I knew that I wanted to, uh, to really focus on um, uh, diversity and inclusion. And so I was always looking for ways to bring those things into the books. And so that when Jules Cassidy showed up in book two, so, like his whole story arc kind of, his whole story arc kind of um, gelled in my head along with the Sam and Alyssa story arc, which is, which is something that I knew um, pretty much by the end of The Unsung Hero, what I was going to do with, with Sam and Alyssa. And I wanted to, um, you know, so, 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 and, and I actually had imagined that their story arc would be more like seven books long. And, and my editor was like, no, it, five is enough. Like, you, <laughs> you, tor- <laughs> you tortured <laughs> us. This to to, Shawnee, that- Shawnee has not read Sam and Alyssa, but to preface this, they meet and it's so beautiful. And you're just like, be together. But there's like distance and there's their egos. And there's Sam's a very homophobic character at the beginning of the series. And then Alyssa's partnered with Jules Cassidy, who is the gay, like very out gay FBI agent character. And over the course of the five books, he becomes friends with Jules. He like gets over his bigotry. He like basically convinces her to love him and that he's changed, that he's grown. And they of course have some very sexy interludes across the five (laughs) books. One involving chocolate sauce. I'm just saying, Shawnee, you'll like it. And it was, I was happy you finally made it to their book though. And same with Jules's book. Like when you finally made it to, um, all through the night, I was like, "Finally, get so, to the get to this book." So this yeah. actually leads me to a question um, that we usually uh, ask a little bit later on. But like, I mean, I'm loving you, Suze. Let me tell you right now. Um, so when you were writing characters that are different from yourself, different culture, different ethnicity, uh, what do you do to prepare? How do you write a character that is different from you? I try to talk to people in my life <laughs> and, and just, to, just to, and, and try to just get a sense of who people are. Um, but, but, but my kind of tried and true thing is to go to, um, to personal essays written by people who are like the character that I'm imagining. So, um, uh, 
just just about their just like kind of like about what it was like to grow up in in their world, which you know, because I because I grew up I grew up in the sixties and seventies in Connecticut, and you know, and 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 um, and I so I have that I have that background pretty. You know, I'm pretty good at figuring. You know, knowing what that was like, but but um, but pretty much, you know, any anybody who like I'm, I am so not a Navy SEAL, right? Like I'm like, <laughs> I'm like oh, I'm a little cold. I don't think I can go out. You know, like <laughs> like and 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 my toe hurts. I'm like I have to I have to watch a lot of TV now. And and um, <clears throat> so so in getting to in, into the head of a Navy SEAL, like I have to go and and dig into. Um, you know, really what, 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 what the fuck is wrong with you? That would make you, you know, want to do something like that. And, and so, um, and, and, and the same, the same thing goes for really just about any of my characters, but particularly people who aren't like white people who grew up named Susie and lived in Connecticut. And, and, um, and so, so yeah, but it really, I, I really find that, um, that reading, just kind of blogs and and articles and just just essays about growing up from people who in their own voices to get a feel of of what it's like to to not be me you know in a, in any situation and 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 then and then just really um really kind of sit with it and and imagine it and really try to really try to understand the differences and the similarities and and to uh to kind of get past my own my own privilege of where I grew up to see what the world could be like you know even when I was a kid I I I always really preferred books that um that were I think that, that I can't remember who de, who defined like books are either mirrors or windows right so you're either seeing a reflection of yourself or you're or you're looking out into a world that you that it might be um, different or not what you're used to, and and I and just as a kid, I just always preferred the the window books, the 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 look at a life that was not my own, and um, because I because I loved I loved the idea that that there's so many different ways to look at things and so many different ways to be. So, you know, so that whole kind of, you know, the Star Trek infinite diversity and infinite combinations thing, I like, like it just, it just really resonated with me. And, and uh, so, yeah. Yeah. I think that that is great. One thing that I think, you know, reading your story and doing research for this and obviously reading your books all these years is you worked really hard at the beginning to start, throwing in like LGBT characters and characters of color as like little side characters or like, oh, they're mentioned, but maybe not a main character. And then like every book you added more and more and more and more. And I think that's so admirable because there's tons and tons of people who would have just been like, oh, that's the way it is. That's how I sell books. Okay, well, just only include white Christian characters. And the longevity of that. And the longevity for sure. And one thing that I think like I would love for, you know, people listening to this who are readers and, you know, authors or future authors is why it's important for you as a white woman who is published to have all this diversity in your books, showing that they sell, showing that a gay romantic book will sell so that it opens doors for other people, own voices and different characters. Yeah, that's, it is, I think, and you know, when I was, you know, cause I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, where I started and what, what the, what the romance genre was, was like at the time, you know, I was just um, having a conversation with somebody through email um, about the fact that back when I started writing in the mid nineties, you, your heroine was expected to be um, petite and blonde, you know, like, and beautiful. Like there, it was just like, that was a given. So anything that anybody who wasn't that was it like, and, and it's just like, like, wow, you're so limited. And, and, and immediately I, I felt the constraints of that and wanted to, um, and really actively like, like when I was first told to, you know, to erase the gay character from my very first book, that was, um, that you know not a main character you know like oh my god and 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 it was really eye-opening to me and and then it was kind of like okay um 
I see what you're doing here. I'm going to push back. If you're, you know what, you're going to have to, you're going to, you can, you can tell me that I have to take this character out. I'm going to argue with you. I ultimately need to feed my children. <laughs> and so I'm going to change it up, but I'm like, you're going to know that I'm pissed about it. And the next book, you're going to have to do it again because I'm not going to take this and, and, and just like, and make it be a rule because I'm going to push against you because I believe that, that readers want this. I believe readers li like, like me as a kid want to see a, a diverse and colorful world. And, um, and so, you know, I was just thinking, I was thinking about the unsung hero because, um, cause I know you guys are, are doing it for your podcast, doing it, <laughs> um, <laughs> reading it, <laughs> doing your podcast thing with it. Um, but, um, you know, that was published 20 years ago and, and, um, there's a character in it, David Sullivan, who is, um, Asian. And the reason that character is there is because, um, I had written a book a few years earlier, just recently, recently in, in my writing kind of progression of, of when I wrote the unsung hero, but it was a book that was published um, by a silhouette called um, "Love with the Proper Stranger," and and um, and the main the hero is an FBI agent, and his sidekick, his kind of FBI guy, is um, is an Asian man named um, Daniel Tanaka, and um, and the the editor told me that I sh should make him I should make him a white guy, or or I wouldn't be asked to write his sequel. A book with it with featuring him and 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 I was just like you know and and I was like okay no I'm not I'm not changing him he is a great character he's actually kind of like a Jules Cassidy prototype so it, you know like kind of like this like kind of like just just it was I was playing with the idea of the of the power dynamic between a boss and a and a, a person who works beneath him and and um and so, okay, so I had just been told that Daniel Tanaka was not going to be given his own story. And, and I was like, okay, so here I'm, I'm, I'm outlining the unsung hero. I'm getting ready to write it. And, um, and I've got this idea for the subplot with the younger characters. And, and there's my graphic artist um, character, a young man. And, um, and I'm like, and I, and I really, I'm going to make him an, an, Asian American man and and um, but I have to I want to try to sneak him in so I'm going to call him David Sullivan and maybe no one will notice <laughs> Asian and and but it was you know but the, the whole idea of like of of um of of taking that rejection from one publisher and then and then and then going to another one and saying like I know you know what you guys have just told me and I'm going to give this character he's going to win the 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 heart of this really awesome young woman and they're going to have sex on page and they're going to you know and and, and he, you know what and it, it's and so so that idea of fighting back of keep, of keeping pushing with um with instead of instead of hitting a no and stopping like hitting a no and then doing like again my policy do what I needed to do to feed my kids and and then and and push as much as I can before that and then make them make them to, you know say those horrible racist awful things to my face again next book if they if you know and and you know I had editor, editors say well you know and here in New York and and it's not you know like we think differently so that and and I'm like no <laughs> no there are readers who want this believe me and and um you know the same pushback with um with uh uh with black characters when I first wrote um Harvard's Education which was in my Tall Dark and Dangerous series in the late 90s um that was the it, it, like I was actually told to, to my face that this, uh, I could write this book if I really, really wanted to, but they would, um, it would have half of the print run of the other books featuring white characters. And, and I'm like, I'm like, and I'm kind of like, are you, do you know you said that aloud? <laughs> I'm kind of like, like, what are you, what, like, and, and the, this whole idea of they'd get letters from the racist people who didn't want to read about black people. Like, like what world do I live in, really? And and so so as a as a writer, I just kept like going, well, yeah, I'm gonna write Harvard's book, and and you know what? And I and, and I had this kind of, <laughs> I kind of 
like my my own journey through my own privilege was, you know, followed a lot of the familiar beats. Like there was, you know, that was a little bit of a like a white savior moment in there. Well, I'll I'll publish, I'll write Harvard's education, and they'll see that you know books with black characters will sell, and 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 the word, you know, ah, oh, the choir of angels will sing, and they'll start publishing them, and. Well. But it, it might have it might not have happened immediately, but I definitely think it did keep pushing it forward to your point. Oh, it did for absolutely. sure allow more space in the market and more. So we've we've heard a lot in sort of the romance landia space, like, oh, I don't feel like it's like my story to tell. And I understand that it is important to give people like who are writing own voices books a platform and space to publish and space in publishing. But I also don't want to read books that only have all white characters in in a mod especially in contemporary because it's just not a fact i mean we just live in such a diverse world there's very few places in america now that only have i mean they exist but very few if you're writing anything that's based in a city and only has white characters that's just not representative and we've had, you know, a couple things where we've seen on Twitter or we've, you know, heard from different authors that they're like, oh, well, I just felt like it would be weird to just stick in X, Y, Z character in the book. And like, what would you say to those authors to kind of encourage them that you're not maybe stealing someone else's book if you include more diversity in your book? Well, I think that I think that the, the, that what, so the kind of the flip side of not doing it is erasure. Like, like it's, it's, and it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like that, that the, the example of my first book where I was told to make the, the sheriff not gay because and I would, I had to erase the gay people from my book and, and, and it's it, people <laughs> Like people deserve to be represented. And, and this is, you know, we live in America. And I, I would argue that there's no community out there where there aren't people of color, where there aren't gay people, where there aren't, you know, a, a, just like a world of, there's not a world of diversity there because there is, we just don't see it. And and when, so when you're focusing your attention on on one particular story and you're you're ignoring the rest of it, um, that's that's not good either. And, and so... It's it's really I think it's really about about showing the world, and and when I and when I first started writing, it was about showing a world that I wanted. Um, in 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 particular, well, an example would be Jules Cassidy, an out gay FBI agent, agent at the time I was writing the, the, this books. This was when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was like in heavy. Um, <laughs> that was the mode, you know, like, and, and so, and so I create J Jules Cassidy and I let him have a rainbow flag on his desk and he's, you know, he is who he is. And, and um, the idea is that, well, in the real FBI, you couldn't do that, but it's like, well, in my world, I'm going to, I'm going to open that door for now and, um, and, and, and tell that story. Um, it's, I, I think that, I think it's, it's, you know, when I first started writing, because they're like the, the idea that that's not my story to tell, I, I recognize how important that is for own voices authors to be out there. Um, but back in the day, I was my book. Um, OK, let's take Harvard's education again. OK, it was um, it was oh, man, it was something like number 781 in the in the Silhouette Intimate Moment series of books. And it was the second book. In the in out of those seven hundred and eighty one to feature black characters, and and so so clearly so clearly the other white authors were taking the no and backing down, and and um, and so if I didn't do it, who would? And and because they weren't, they clearly weren't like hiring authors of color at that time, or if they were, it was they were writing it they were writing again the same stories for you know, Karen blonde and white protagonists. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And just like, yeah. yeah. And the petite blonde heroine, you know, and, 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 and so, so I'm, so I'm looking at it from this kind of the, the you know, from the history of it and, and from what it was like in the nineties when I was doing it. Um, it's a, it's a definitely a different world out there. Thank God. You know, there's, there's, when I wrote, when I wrote hot target, which was 2000 and, Four, I think. 
I actually have, I, I got out my reader's guide to the troubleshooter series because I know it was a thing that a, kind of this thing that we put together um, or I, I pushed the publisher to do when um, Into the Storm came out. So that was book 10. So, it, but it have, I have like all this information about the books because I, you know, it was a long time ago. Okay. Hot Target came out in January of 2005. And um, when that book came out with, with, um, with a subplot with a gay rela- relationship with Jules Cassidy meets Robin Chadwick in that book, we did not know if Romantic Times and the other reviewers would review it because there were gay characters in it. We did not know. Wow. And, we did, and, and, and the publisher did not know when there was, a, so there was a huge amount of publisher support for this book and, and a huge amount of, of, of um, realization that we were kind of boldly going and, um, and, and, you know, there, the, the Random House and, and, um, and uh, Ballantyne's support was just incredibly enormous. Like it, it was like, yes, this is a romance novel and this is a great story and we're gonna, you know, we're getting behind this. And it actually, the book actually won um, Borders best-selling hardcover of the year. Do you guys remember Borders? You, you yes, probably, I yes. Used to, we talked about it with your mom. Listen. We've talked about this on the podcast before that me and her yes. separately, because we, we didn't know each other until a few years ago, but we used to go to the borders in our neighborhoods and we would do like everyone. We'd sit in the aisles and we'd read through all these yeah. books and yeah, hand bring them a off to our sisters. And bring <laughs> you, you and your home girl, you'd lay yeah. there, pass books back and forth. Or we used to play a game called um, Guess That Celebrity, right? So if you took a romance novel, the, like the the people on the cover you'd flash it you you'd flash it in front of their face for only like two seconds two seconds and you'd be like who was that who <laughs> like what right. celebrity was that <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> Well, we, I actually was just rereading Hot Target right before this interview, just because I wanted to get back in the mind space, you know, I wanted to like relive it. Um, And first of all, I just love the book so much. I think it's, I mean, all of your books, obviously huge fan. They're all just so well written. But one of my favorite things is that um, you don't portray everyone as having the same feelings as, as they do in real life. So not everyone is happy about Jules Cassidy being gay and being in this book or being in the FBI or being wherever. Like he talks about how there's people in the FBI who pretend he doesn't exist. And right. he has to, in the book, he has to share a hotel room with his boss. Um, and he's like, are you sure you want to do this? Like rumors might start. It might be bad for your career. And the guy's like, whatever, it's fine. We'll figure it out. And I, le- and then there's obviously some people who are his champion right away and who are like, you know, proud members of, you know, he flagged like Cosmo is like, you know, his mom married his dad, but they were never really married. And then the uncle came to live with them. And so he's always, you know, grown up around that. So I like that. I think it's so important because you hear the mentality as you hear the characters talking in their, you know, in their internal dialogues of what they're thinking. And like Deck doesn't, isn't really comfortable with it, but he's like, oh, I'll get over with it because he's good at his job. And so you see how people like, as they're introduced to this character, maybe for the first time and readers, maybe they're introduced to a gay character or a gay person for the first time. Maybe they probably know some in their life, but they don't know, no, at this time, who knows? But I think that's so cool because it would have felt very um, not true if just like everyone loved Jules Cassidy and he was just beloved by everyone. I think that wouldn't, the story wouldn't have worked as well. Right. Right. You know, I actually created Jules Cassidy and I created, um, uh, I created Sam as uh, as Sam represents my readers, um, who who um, the the readers who like okay so I'm writing military romantic suspense um, and can you say conservative <laughs> and so so I'm so so I know that about my readership going in and um, and so I think okay so I I want the, you know I've got Jules Cassidy I want I want this character I and and Alyssa loves him okay so Alyssa is is his straight best friend <laughs> he's her he's her gay best friend and he and he starts he starts out in the troubleshooters books as um as the as the kind of traditional gay witty sidekick right so we see him and we are introduced to him through Alyssa and then there's Sam who's like homophobic and 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 um and 
and and a little and very freaked out by Jules. So so that so that's kind of what I wanted to do was I wanted that Sam to take my readers' hands, the the traditional people, the conservative people, the people who didn't have a gay friend or know that they had a gay friend, and they were going to take Sam's hand and they were going to take that journey with Sam as he got to know Jules as a person throughout the story. And, and if you and if you look at the Troubleshooter series, Jules Cassidy is my deus ex machina more often than not, because I wanted to like, like there's time for subtlety in books, but then there's also time to get out the sledgehammer. And this was a sledgehammer moment for me with, with wanting to, to have Jules save the day. You know, he's gay and he's wonderful. He's brilliant. He's incredibly skilled and he saves the day and he's heroic again and again and again with the sledgehammer. Boom, boom. It's Jules Cassidy. Boom. And and so that so that the readers who were maybe on the fence about him or maybe even kind of horrified by the idea that he was gay would fall in love with him the way Sam did. That get get to know him as a person, realize that their beliefs about about those scary gay people was just just was just lack of education and ignorance and that and and so so while I was writing the books I was also actively working for um, mass equality um, and we were working towards marriage equality and so so I learned a lot about um, so this was in the you know late nineties early two thousands um, and I'm learning a lot about how um, LGBTQ organizations change hearts and minds and how being out in the community, literally out in the community, um, just makes a huge difference in terms of, of, of changing hearts and minds. Because we, when you go and you, what you have to do is you have to put on your Teflon suit and you have to go and you have to talk to people who hate you for being you until they get to know you. And then they, you know, and, and it's, it's a, it's a really difficult thing to do, but it's, but once you do it, man, does it work. And, and we, we, so working with LGBTQ organizations, I was watching the tide turn about how Americans viewed their gay neighbors and, and, and watching this happen in real time. And I realized that I was, I could do the same thing with my books by creating Jules Cassidy by, um, and, and then again, you know, getting out the sledgehammer and, and then showing uh, Sam's relationship through the books. And if you look, if you look at the books, like when you first meet Jules, yep, he's the witty sidekick. And then I do an off page romance for Jules. He's got a live in boyfriend named Adam and Sam gets to be a little squeezy about that, you know, and and um, and and but then and Sam realizes, oh. That sounds a lot like, you know, love and being in a relationship, just uh, like like my straight life. And and then and then in the next book, and, and oh, and Sam, and then Jules and, and Adam have broken up, and Jules' heart is broken, and Sam really relates to that. So, you know, so so by by having the reader experiencing that through Sam's eyes. As Sam's awakened, <laughs> um, it really, it really worked. <laughs> so it got to the point. I mean, really early on in the series, I would go on these book tours and um, and l- like the the like I do Q and As and and this first or second question was, will we see more of Jules Cassidy? And I could be in like red Kansas. I could be in Oklahoma and I and I would be getting these questions. And it was just so gratifying to 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 realized that I was getting through, you know, that, that it was, that strategy was working, you know? Yeah. You know, like, like, so as somebody who grew up in a super conservative, very conservative family, um, (laughs) I actively remember like the idea of like, well, one, I didn't know what gay was until I was probably much older than I should, like should have known. Right. And I remember like learning about it and then feeling like the world opened up like Disneyland. I was like, what? What? <laughs> what is this? Not everybody is just this this way, you know? And then very quickly learning that that wasn't okay. You know, like that's, you know, and it was always a thing like, oh no, we don't hate anybody. We just, we're just not okay with that. Like, that's just not, we don't, and then we don't do that in our family. We don't, you know, like that sort of thing. And I remember like the, really the first time, like having like an inkling, like this seems really, Sweet, like weird as I, I used to walk this boy from a class we had together to his next class because he would get beat up like in that, you know, yeah. in that mm-hmm. walk. So like, because I'm a black girl, everybody assumes I can fight and that I will, like, I hit that angry black woman thing. So nobody would mess with me. 
Mm -hmm. you know, if I just had my resting face. And so I could walk him and he could, you know, whatever. But he would get beat up because he was gay. And, or he was presumed gay because he was not out gay. Um, He was definitely gay. But like, you know, um, and like, that was the first time I was like, this is so ludicrous. But I actively remember having to like deprogram like over the years being like, I don't believe this is wrong. I don't believe it. However, still at that same time, you're saying stuff like, oh, that's okay, da, 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 whatever, you know, and you're not really thinking about it. You're like in high school, whatever. Um, but I felt like I had to deprogram, like I was leaving a, like a cult or something to like, I remember like the first time I saw guys kissing and I, I was like, ooh, and then I was like, why is that ooh? I remember having this conversation. Why is that ooh? That's not ooh. Like, you know, that's beautiful. And every time I would see it, I'd be like, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Until it like rang true, basically. So your brain believes it and starts re-putting all of that into a new box, new context, uh, and whatever. And I feel like it took years to really, for to, to default as just like, that's what it is. Enjoy it. Enjoy your life, you know, like, or whatever. So the fact that it's uh, available for people and probably and younger readers and um, teenagers to read in your books as just like, that's what it is, you know? Um, and getting to see both sides, I think is amazing because I wish I had have had that context early on and not just hearing a one side of what that looks like um, or whatnot. And I think, yes, I hear what you're saying. And I think that, um, that that's where the erasure, the erasure is so damaging. You know, don't have gay characters in your books. Don't have black characters in your books. Like, like, what are we? What are we? What message are we giving to to people who are looking for a reflection? What message are we giving people who like if you? You didn't have a word for it, and and um and that's that is it, it's so important to like you know don't say gay. Do you remember that there was this whole campaign? Don't say gay, and and George Takei came in and said say Takei. You know, I mean, <laughs> but but um but that like but that the whole idea is if you, you take the word away, you're you're if you don't have a vocabulary for it. You just can't, what do you do if you're a kid? All you know is that you're, you're, you're different and you're wrong. And there, and that the messaging that, that, that comes with that, which is just not, not true, but you know, it's funny. Cause as a, like, okay, so I'm 60 years old. And um, so I grew up in the, you know, I was, um I was 10 in 1970. And so, so the, the, I, the, the, the word that, I grew up with, you know, it was the F, it was the F word, the, the horrible gay slur F word. And, and it took a really long time to not, to, 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 to recognize, oh, that's, a, that's not nice. Don't say that. And don't, you know, don't, don't, that's like not okay. And, and a lot of people my age really, I think really do struggle with it, with, with the, and, and you really literally have to deprogram. I think you, yeah, that's amazing that you did that and that, and that you, that you recognized it and and actively worked and, and that's just i think it's just beautiful and really really um th- really what you have to do when when you've been t- when you've been told over and over again a certain vocabulary and 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 um you know to break yourself of it is is can be a really hard thing to do i had to i had to actually work with my mother to um to get her to stop whispering the word gay do you think it's <laughs> You know, like, and, and, and I was like, no, mom, you have to say, uh, like, you know, my chest. husband is gay. And she would wear, I got her a P flag pin and she would, and she would ab- absolutely like, I mean, she's the most awesome um, LGBTQ ally. She and my, my dad, they're 90, you know, and, and, um, and they just kick ass like when they're out there because they're, they're so outspoken, but, but it, but, but you first, you have to recognize like, first of all, why are you whispering that? Like, think about, think about what messages you're giving to J Jason, if you will only say, you know, gay without, saying, gay, you know, and it, 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 because it really, those things really, really, really matter. Well, and there's, sorry, there's like a, a thing that happens and you, you're not going to unnotice it once I say it. Right. But black people notice this. Um, and it's when you're, when you're black, people always take a pause or a beat or a stutter before they say the word black. So they'll, they'll be like, my friend, uh, black friend, like, or whatever. There's always a pause before the word black. And you won't be able to unhear it now that I've told you, yeah. but everybody does it. Um, and it's so interesting. Um, and I remember um, probably to this day, I'm actually still a bit salty about this one thing that happened to me in college. There were, there were many things. Um, but uh, 
they they would not cast any black characters in my theater department other than to be a servant or anything else. Now this is not this is not the 70s, 60s, 50s. This is like 2010, 2012 or whatever. Um and they did uh so I was there for years, never get cast. The other black characters don't get cast. It's getting in the department, it's just getting more and more tension about this, right? Yeah. And then they had done this big play um, where casting didn't matter so much. And they, again, didn't really cast any black people or whatever. Um, so finally, they're going to do a black play. Like this play is blackity black. Like, you know, everybody in this is supposed to be black. They're, it's about Afro-Cubans, okay? okay. <laughs> and so we're all in the back, like, ooh, you know, specifically, like, I'm, I identify as, like, Afro-Latina. Uh, so, like, uh, I'm like, whoa, okay, this is, this is our moment. We're all super duper excited. The casting list comes out. Everybody they cast is white. Oh, they, they, took, they took the play and they took out every racial reference out of the play. Oh, um, no. and did it, did it totally white, um, or whatever. And this has actually changed the, the trajectory of my degree because at that point I was like, they, why am I waiting for a seat at anybody's table at this point? So like I switched and I was like, how do I do a directing path? How do I put on my own plays? How do I, you know? And from that point on, I started doing my own plays in like a secondary theater that we had at, uh, uh, or whatever. And I just cast whoever the hell I wanted to, <laughs> whatever they wanted to. Um, and it was, it was great, you know, and people like really loved being in, in my plays, but like, that was definitely a, a moment where like, I was like, wow, wow. Like, even when it calls for the most blackity black of people, they will erase you. Like you, yeah. like you don't exist, you know? And Afro-Latinos specifically have a big, is a big thing to do with erasure in that community. So it's <sighs> definitely, um, you know, Bridget and I talk about this a lot and we kind of muse about it, but it's like, uh, if you're a, a brown person or an LGBTQ person and you uh, write a book and it fails, that's it. That was your one shot, you right. know, to, to get it right, you know, and they're not going to give you another shot, you know, but right. if a Suzanne Brackman does it at, on her scale and it's successful, then that opens doors because you right. get more than one shot. You're going to, they're going to give you more than one shot to fail, you know? And so it's definitely a very interesting um, discussion and topic. And, you know, and we do hear from other authors like, oh, it's not my story to tell. It's whatever. Um, and honestly, I'm like, that's bullshit. Like, I'm, I'm not a Navy SEAL. I'm not a cowboy. I could write a cowboy. Like, because you know what I would do? I would research and yeah. talk, to, talk to some cowboys. You know what I'm saying? Talk to some Navy SEALs. Shani, I would love to talk Shani, to some Navy Shani SEALs. would go talk to some cowboys. Cowboys, you know what I'm saying? Talk to some I'm Navy like, SEALs. I she would put in the, the time. She would put in the time. <laughs> put in the work. Put in you know, the work. But, like anything else, you know, like you would talk to someone. I'm not an astronaut. Yeah. I would talk to an astronaut. I'd read up on an astronaut. I'd watch a masterclass by Chris Hardwick, you know, like, so to me, the idea of not writing a story because you're in that, that one thing um, is ludicrous. Honestly, to I, me, it's ludicrous. It's lazy and it's ludicrous. I, I kind of feel, I think, I think it's like people modern. try I was okay. oh sorry. I was just gonna say I feel like it's people trying to be like too nice and too like oh, but I don't want to make a mistake. That's kind of what I get that feeling from, and I'm like, yeah. See, I think it's more fear. I think that they're afraid of making a mistake, and I think that they don't want to unpack their privilege. I think that they don't want to. Um, they don't want to. They don't want to do any work to that changes their. Um, that changes their kind of perception of what the world should should be and what and you know things like. Um, Ah oh, man, you know, like um, assimilation. You know, like like um, like. Well, if you if you if you look more like me and you talk more like me, then of course you'll succeed. You know, like like in that. And and if you, but if you but if you if you step back from that and 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 look at people and and their strengths and their storytelling abilities and 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 it's like it's kind of like there are ways to tell a story that aren't your ways and and. So step back from that and, and look and see what the world looks like. If you can kind of, if you can kind of uh, like pull back from everything that, you know, like just because you, just because you, you know it and you learned a, something a certain way doesn't mean that it's the right way or the only way. And so, so that's, so that's where I think a lot of people are really afraid to, um, to like you said, make a mistake 
but they're not willing to they're not willing to try to try and 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 learn and and to and to break down what it is that 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 is keeping them from it you know i just uh. when we started this podcast right we mean it was like eight months before we actually released any episode we tried different things we tested out different stuff we scrapped a bunch of things and i think you have to be willing to scrap a book like oh, you know what i mean like you write this write a book have sensitivity readers do your research do everything you can you know, and be willing to say like, you know what, didn't nail this, scrap it and, and try again. And that's work. That's definitely commitment to you wanting to have uh, things be in, inclusive. You have to really want it in your marrow, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And, it, and you have to, but you have to also be, you have to also be willing to, yeah, the it's yeah. I, I I agree with you, and and there's there's something there's something about the risk of of um of going outside of what you know, and and you know, and and trying trying to trying to learn everything that you can learn without the voices in your heads telling making, you you shouldn't or that yeah, you're wrong yeah. or that it's not yours to yeah. do or it's, it's too different, so it's too scary. Yeah. Like, no, it's not. It's really, really similar. Let me yeah. tell you. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's... I, I also think, I mean, obviously I've read all your books and all of your characters are very different in the sense, not just like the way they look, but the, the way they talk, their little eccentricities and stuff. I'm not saying you write all the same, but also like, they're all just people. Yeah. I also feel like people get real bogged down in like, oh, but it has to be perfect for this. But it's like, Shawnee just mentioned that she's black and people think she's going to be an angry black woman when they see her on the street frowning at them uh, because she's protecting a kid, but she's the furthest thing from an angry black woman that you could possibly be in, like in terms of the stereotype. And, and, you know, I think everyone at the end of the day, if you, if an author would focus on like the person, like you're writing that person within that culture, within that sort of context of the time period or the whatever, but they're still really a person. You're making up a human. You're just making up one fictional character. You're not representing an entire, you know, group forever. You're just telling that one person's story. Right. I, and I think a lot of, um, you know, Romance Landia has come very far in the past few years in terms of um, of 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 authors of color and and LGBTQ authors being allowed to tell the stories that they want to tell. Um, but there's also, there's also a sense of, um, like I, uh, the description of black pain where like, you know, well, you're, I'm sorry, you can't write th that story because your characters are too happy. <laughs> like, like where's, you know, like, like the, the idea of that, like, but that, again, that's, that is fitting, that is trying to fit all stories into, into this kind of white supremacy worldview that we have made here in America. And, and, um, and you, you got to break that down. You have to, you really do. So um, you can tell by the amount of hashtags that black people have, because you got like black girl magic, you got like black boy joy, you know, and all the, all these hashtags are meant to counteract a stereotype that people think doesn't exist, that black boys can't be joyous or they're being killed at an alarming rate. So we need to rebrand them and let people know they're just people, they're having fun, you know, oh that sort of thing. And to to make it uh, take off that aggressive stereotype or whatever it is. And you can, every time I see in a, a new hashtag, I'm just like, I just know that that is a visual representation of rebranding and trying to like, live peacefully in a community you know yeah, just well just like last week i mean when you guys this episode airs it will have been almost two months ago but just last week the proud boys hashtag got taken back over um by the whole gay community and it was so lovely to see who doesn't so want to lovely. see a timeline of just ha pure happiness and yeah. gay marriage and celebration and dancing and uh that like to your point shawnee i mean i think uh, you know rebranding people's ideas and like we've talked about this the whole episode so far as take little steps to like show, no, this is really a person. No. Like when you get to know them as a person, you realize they're a person. They're not just gay. They're a person who is gay. Um, yeah. And I think that is a great distinction. I, I wonder though, how the, the books, so I'm new to you. Uh, Bridget has introduced me to you and I probably will not be going back. Um, but <laughs> like uh, the, I'm curious to know how much it translates also into 
just not that like that one gay friend or that one black friend or Indian friend or whatever. Like, um, because so many times in my life, people would say something like, oh man, those, those black people are, are thugs, but you know, Sean, not, not you, Shawnee, you're, you're like, not like them. Like you're not, you know? And so it, <laughs> um, and because, and also the funny thing is too, because my name is Shawnee, it's not, people don't associate that with like me being black if they don't, if they've never met me or seen me. So like, and I used to babysit and a lot of referral. And so sometimes when I would, and, uh, and I speak really, I speak general standard English, you know, so I would talk to them on the phone. And as soon as they would open the door, like when I would get there, <laughs> there'd always be this pause. They'd be like, oh, Shawnee, <laughs> you know, um, but, uh, but I, I just, I wonder, I mean, I feel like the books themselves give people a gateway in, you know, and I wonder how much it translates to people going outside of their comfort zone in their own lives and getting more than one, you know, one friend of color, one LGBTQIA friend, one, you know, like, but, but even so, I do think that the, um, just the exposure itself opens the door for sure. Um, but I wonder like how many people decide to change their mindset or, or go down that path of deprogramming. Yeah. I mean, I would have, I would have answered the question really differently back before 2016, you know, the, the election of 2016, just like it made me, my head explode and, and, um, and, and, and made me think, did, did none of these readers learn anything? You know, the 53% of white women that, that it makes up a large portion of romance landia, you know, it's a conservative genre. It, it always has been. And, and, um, and it just, it, it, brought me great despair to think, to think that maybe it didn't go beyond that one gay friend or that one black friend. And, and, um, and, and so, you know, so I've been really aware, you know, when I first started writing, like it was, it was a, it was a challenge to bring in characters of color and a challenge to bring in gay characters so that there really only almost could be one. In fact, one of the big complaints of Hot Target um, was that it was a little too gay. <laughs> <laughs> when I wrote it, and there was a, cause there was a big World War II subplot. The book was, the original book was um, probably another, I want to say hundred pages. And, and, um, and we whittled it down and we took out like the, the, it, it was, we took out the whole World War II subplot almost, almost um, essentially um, leaving in just little snippets. Um, but um but so, so that's a, you know, so, so yes, you can have one black friend, but two, you know, that's, and, and, and I, and I think that, you know, as we've, as, so that was kind of back then and you, and it was, you were fighting to get the one black character in there and, and let alone more than one, it would just, it was just a, it was a challenge, but I just kept, again, just always just pushing, always pushing and, and, um, and, and trying to, trying to create a world that, uh, that the conservative readers could um, could get a look at that more accurately reflected the reality of what we all live, because it's such a it's such a fantasy genre to start with, and then and then you add in the the, the Wonder Bread white of <laughs> of so many books and and the erasure that that means, and and it just it's. So it's it's yeah, it's really been a really kind of interesting journey over these past. 25-ish years since I've been writing. I, oh, go Bridget, ahead. we got to talk about this RWA speech. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. You guys, Sis. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link it on our website. Okay, you guys, so oh. it will be in the show notes. It is astonishing. Go ahead, Charlie. First of all, First of all, Bridget was like, so when we got into doing romance podcasting, we didn't really know about the RWA. At least I didn't know about it. Um, I don't know if you did, Bridget. I didn't either. Yeah. So we just started hearing glimpses like of it, like the scandal, the this, the that. And, and of course, I'm nosy. I'm like, what scandal? What happened? Who did it? We followed Twitter threads. Everybody we interviewed or talked to in romance were like, do you know what the scandal is that's happening? And what's going on here and there? And, and the first time we got an inkling of it was um, we were, were doing a panel and uh, one, uh, was she the president of it, Bridget? Um, do you remember her name? Oh, Just three um, names. Um, I'll look it up real quick. Yeah, I, can't, I can't remember her name. She has three names that she writes like uh, 
uh, for suspense yeah romance um but but uh they talked about it a little bit on the panel and this is i think before it got like dismantled after the last scandal or whatever and so that's when we started digging into it um and then bridget was like shawnee you have to read suzanne brockman's like lifetime achievement award speech <laughs> Right. So, so I was reading it and the whole time I was like, Ooh, Oh damn. Oh, Oh shit. <laughs> they done fucked up. <laughs> they done got Sue's mad. <laughs> and I was like, Holy cow. And I told Bridget, I said, this is a Karen for the culture. I'm with it. <laughs> I am with this. <laughs> so I, uh, I, as I was reading it, I was like, I could feel the escalation when you're talking about your first book and how they, how you had to fight back and push back and you're debating whether feeding your children and publishing a book and getting what you need in. So you played the long game. You mm. definitely played the long game and it paid off, you know, it paid off. And I, um, and when you were saying like not being nice anymore and coming, like just coming straight out full force, like I felt every bit of that. And I was just like, slow clapping as I'm reading it. I'm like, this is the, this is the, like, ah, uh, I love this, you know? Um, and I, I, I'm curious to know a little bit more about when you were writing this speech, what was, um, just anything, tell me anything. All right. Well, it, it was really kind of ironic because I was not intending to go to RWA that year. And, and, um, in fact, I was struggling a lot with, um, with, with writing ever since the election. Um, and I, and it, it was, it was, it was really, it was really hard. I was thinking, you know what, I'm just not going to, I'm, I'm just going to retire. That's it. I'm done. And, and then I get a call. Can you, Don't you know, do that. I'm a bitch. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, uh, and, and, and I, and I, I thought about it, it, you know, okay. So Beverly Jenkins had won the year before and she, killed it with her speech and I'm like oh my god great okay so how do you you know it's like I'm following Beverly Jenkins okay and and um and I and I just I just kept thinking isn't there like like isn't there another black author who you could give this achievement award to like that would really that would really give a message and it's just like Beverly it's like Beverly Jenkins and now you know there's there are there, you know Brenda Jackson let's let's like let's 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 do this thing and, and really make a statement with RWA to embrace the authors of color that we've ignored for so many years. And, and so I was taking the weekend and I was thinking, I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to accept this award. And then they announced that they'd given it to me. And it was kind of like, okay, all right. So I, I thought I, I didn't realize I'd accepted it over the phone, but okay, let's, let's do this. <laughs> And let's think about this. And, um, and I got to tell you, at the time, my best friend in the world was dying of cancer. And, and I knew that the summer was going to be a really hard time to travel. And, um, and yet I recognized that, that, that the board of directors had chosen me to, to make this speech for a reason. And, um, and it was particularly, um, meaningful to me because I had been, I had been censored by this organization in the past. And it, so, so I was like, okay, so this is going to be a challenge because I know they're going to ask for my speech. And they, they asked and they, they asked so many times, we're going to put it on a teleprompter. And I'm like, nope, <laughs> no, thanks. Oh, I didn't finish <laughs> it. I don't, I don't have it. I left it in my suitcase. <laughs> you know what? I'll be, I'll be tweaking it all the way up to the final day and nope, no, thank you. And, and uh, because I knew like, I'm going to, I'm really, I'm, I'm going to put that on a teleprompter. <laughs> it's, kind of like, yeah, it's like, it's like, should I pack my large like flamethrower or my medium flamethrower, you know, and, and so it was really, so as I was writing it, I was dealing with the incredible grief of, of the loss of, of my, or the coming loss. Cause you know, when it's cancer, you get this, you know, you get a good long time to grieve um, of, of my good friend, Bill. And, um, and, and, and he really wanted me to go to give the speech because he knew I was going to burn the place down. And, um, and, and, you know, he was getting sicker and sicker and sicker and, and, and um, he actually went into hospice the Sunday after I gave the speech and, and, and we flew home and immediately went to, to be with him. Um, 
so so that was so that was going on for me and you know and it, and it just it, it kind of added to my zero fucks left to give kind of sense of of and 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 the re the the sense of of like okay um it was right it was in advance of the election in in um in in 2018 so i knew i could make it i could i needed to say something about that and and so i just decided to i just decided to go for it and to and to tell my story and i was given you know i think it was 20 minutes um and i you know and i so I, the the speech i wrote was much longer and included um included my experience with with writing harvard's education and i had to i ended up taking that out and making it about focusing on the the gay characters i'd written in my books um because that has a, a that's a personal thing for me and my son um but um but yeah it was just it was just this kind of like well I, I got to use this platform to um to try to just wake people up i just i just have to do this and and um and it was you know it was it was pretty scary <laughs> you can see if you watch the if you watch the i mean really when we and when i was preparing for it man i just like i rehearsed it a bazillion times so that i wouldn't cry while i was doing it because I, I just didn't want to do that um i um, I had my husband and son who are both, um, screenwriters and really, really funny people. I had them, um, write me a list of things that I could say if I was heckled. Love it. Yes. <laughs> I, so I had that yes. in my notebook. Get some punch up jokes. <laughs> I had a plan for if they cut my mic. I mean, really, I, I honestly didn't know what was going to happen when I went up there and you can see there's a port, there's a, like, there's a place in the, in the, on the video where, um, where I recognize that um, that I'm doing this and that that they haven't cut my mic. <laughs> the momentum you see that the momentum is growing. But, like it's, it's like this. It's kind of realization in my eyes that um, that I can kind of I can kind of take the uh, the hypervigilance down a notch. <laughs> but um, but you know it was it was just something that it was really important. Um, for me to to do and say and to and to and and how often am you know really how often am I going to get a lifetime achievement award and if I couldn't if I couldn't use it to to try to shake things up what, what it wasn't worth going unless I was going to do that so so you know it, it just it it just was something that was really important to me to do and and um did you it. you called 53 percent of white women racist I mean, you went in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think my favorite part of the, of the thing was was um, now I'm going to get political. I say something like that. Oh yeah. no, I haven't gone there yet. And, I love and, that. I love when you're like that. Yeah. I'm you're like, like, oh, oh no, I haven't gone, gone there yet. You haven't gone political. <laughs> that was like that moment where, like, you know, it's the equivalent of when you see your mom's eyes. Like, you you might yell at your mom or something, and then you see her look at you with that slow, with the big eyes. I was like, when you said. <laughs> Oh, now I'm gonna get political. I was like, Oh, now she's gonna get political. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm like, I'm well the way. I, I, I mean, obviously, I think it was very brave. But what was the response from? Because yes. you said your friend was sick, so you obviously didn't like hang around for the whole convention weekend and like chit chat and go did. to lunches. We were, we were there for most of the time. I mean, we like we left on we were left on Sunday, which is the day that. And we got there. I mean, we got there. Um, I think we got in Wednesday or Thursday. But but okay. Jason and his husband came with us because Jason, actually, my son, um, was the person who introduced me. Um, yeah, that was and, very sweet. And, uh, and so you know, so that was kind of um, so it was kind of cool. So I was I was with Jason and, and and Matt, his husband, and my my husband too. So it was you know it was. And it was Denver, which was lovely, but it was, it, it just, it was just a really stressful time because Bill was sick and we were, we were um, just, we knew it was not, he didn't have long and, and, uh, um, and then, and then, then to push for RWA to actually post it, to post the video. Cause I really wanted Bill to see it. And, and uh, we got a, I got a chance to show it to him. Cause he, that just mattered to me, you know, that like, but um but yeah, you know, it was, it was the reaction, like, like I, it was a really big room. Um, I, I remember that the, that I got a lot of standing ovations. I do know that people left. Um, I, I was, a, I was aware of that and, and 
but, but, you know, I wasn't heckled <laughs> and I wasn't, you know, I didn't, they didn't cut my mic and, and I figured, you know, like that, like, so I, I kind of had a low bar. <laughs> it honestly kind of shocks me that people would leave the room. I mean, one of the things I think in general, that's cool is like speaking truth to power and like the RWA, as we've come to learn, you know, for a lot of years was this really powerful, you know, they could give out these awards, which could help you get a publisher. They could do, you know, like they really did have a lot of sort of clout. Um, and I think it's great because I, I mean, now we've been seeing a lot of authors who are like, I'm done with RWA. And we're like a lot of authors have left the organization in well, the last yeah, few years. This past, um, did you, you guys know about the thing that happened with Courtney Milan in December, right? Do you? Because that's we only, a whole, we only know thing. like it's hard to get like facts nobody about wants it. to tell us. <laughs> tell us the Suzanne. full truth, <laughs> Suze. Spill, Suze. You need um, to know. There's some people that like if you go onto Twitter and like there there are people who kept timelines. I mean, it, it's really worth it's worth digging into and, and reading about because it was really interesting how the um, how the the kind of institutionalized white supremacy of the or, of like in the organization made it so that um, people marginalized people had trouble speaking up and speaking out and it was really really embedded the 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 um the the kind of the whiteness of of the organization um and 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 it so so it is worth it is worth finding out about there and like i said like if you look on twitter um there are a number of people who actually kind of timelined it and and uh uh, yeah, I mean, we I'll, I'll we can see where you can find that because it is it's it's I mean, it is way too long to talk about and yeah. and it just but it was really kind of um, it it really like the, the curtain was pulled back with yeah. with um, what happened with Courtney and and the, the kind of the ugly kind of the the ugliness was really revealed that that in and you could see that in our an organization i mean this is a group that had like millions of dollars to to use for things like conferences i mean this is a big old organization that was really um uh not um inclusive in many ways and it's, in, it's interesting because like bridget you just said like oh i'm shocked that people would leave the room and i'm like really i'm not i'm not shocked I don't only, know, but this reminds, I know, I, but I, I, I only because they're from. at an award and people like to look yeah, good. And they pe- do. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, people, I, do know like so mean. I can imagine them afterwards, like bad mouthing and yes. being catty, but like, however, during it, however, I am so used to the boldness of yeah. racism right. that yeah. the idea of people standing up and leaving, you know, uh, and prejudice, like it makes total sense to me. I remember before, um, you know, I am not, I generally don't tell people who I'm voting for. However, Trump was not the person I was voting for. Um, in, in the last Shocker. Election. Shocker. <laughs> I always who I'm voting for, you know, uh, mostly because Susan's I- wearing I, a Biden shirt. No matter what, just I, do a, lot of, I do shirt. a lot of research. No matter what, I do a lot of research on what, what I'm doing. And in general, I just like, it's like religion. I keep that shit to myself. Um, but in the last election, I remember, um, like a bunch of us, we were all YouTubers and we were sitting around these 10 editing bays. So you have like 10 YouTubers sitting around. We're all discussing the election. We're all pretty much friends at this point because we're editing through the holidays and, and all that stuff. And so it was right before the election. And every day we would talk about it, like, oh, who's going to win the election and blah, 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 um, as we're throwing snacks to each other. And I remember um, us doing a, a bet, taking a bet. Right. And uh, everybody's like, of course, Trump's not going to win the election. I said, oh, 100% Trump's winning the election. Right. So I was actually the only one who won the bet, won quite a few dollars. Um, and it wasn't because I thought Trump was the, a good president. It was because I'm from Florida. Like, I grew up in Florida. And when you grow up in Florida, you, you uh, encounter bold, the boldness of um, racism and prejudice and people assume because you're brown or Hispanic or whatever, that you are not conservative. And that is, that's probably an assumption that's really dumb to make because when you're dealing, um, with people who are conservative or I'm probably not going to say this right. Cause I, I don't mean to bash conservatives at all. Um, when you are voting, here, here's a better example. When I went to church with my mom, right. The pastor stood at the pulpit and said, and this is my, this is like Obama election. This is like, you know, or no, it was Bush. 
I don't remember. I don't know how old I am. Anyways, um, he stood at the pulpit and he said, if you're for, if you're for, he's like, because we take money from the government, I can't tell you who to vote for. He said, but if you want to kill babies, you know who to vote for. If you want to see the world go to hell, you know how to vote for them. You know what I mean? So people were sitting there being conflicted with their religion and their politics, you know? And so you think your immortal soul is going to be affected by the person you vote for. And that's something I can't be mad at somebody for. Do you know what I mean? Like I saw people sit there and be manipulated by their pastor. And so that was, that was hard for me. That's why it was very, actually very hard for me to be like, when they said like, all Trump supporters are racist. I was like, no, I actually watch a lot of people there sit there and be manipulated and think that they're going to hell if they don't follow a certain way, you know? And that was really difficult uh, for me to ingest. And that's hard to fight against because now you're fighting people about their immortal soul. Do you know what I mean? You're fighting with them against God. And there's no fighting with God. I learned that as a very young age. My mom would be like, God told me to tell you to do your homework. And I'm like, how do I fight God? I can't fight God. Um, so that was a that's a concept. So I took a very kind of backseat approach to talking to people about politics. Uh, backseat is not a, a, the right word. Um, a gentler approach when I was talking to people because I needed to know where they were coming from. Why did you vote the way you did? What are the things that you're hearing? A lot of people are hearing just the good things that are for them and they're ignoring all the other stuff. And so it was hard to do that because it's very easy to be like, if you vote for Trump, you are an asshole, racist ass, motherfucker, ass, blah, 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 you know? Um, and it was, it was definitely a, a learning lesson and a lesson in compassion. Let me tell you all, a hard lesson in compassion, especially when you're dealing with family members, um, to get to the root of why they are, um, what their concerns are in their election. And then addressing those in a way that is constructive. Um, boy, mm -hmm. let me tell you, let me tell you, it's a, it's a doozy, you know? But um, I don't know why I told you all that, but there was a point to it at some point, but I lost it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's just, you know, uh, but the RW, oh, that's what we were talking about, the RWA uh, situation. Um, we will go down that rabbit hole and try to put that all together um, or whatnot. Uh, but I would like there to see there be another organization because it looks like this one has blown up. Um, um, they're back. They actually, I think they're, I'm not a member at this point, but um, but they, I think they managed to, to save it and they, they, they got, they, they kind of started fresh with their staff. I mean, they had to lose like everybody who had been running the organization um, uh, prior to you know, for, for the past 20 years or whatever it's been. And, and um, I, I, I'm really not up on it because again, I'm not, a, I, had, I have not rejoined, um, but, um, but they, I do think they may have, they may have managed to save it. They did an online um, uh, conference this past summer. Um, so they're, they're, so RWE st does still exist. And, and I, 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 you know, I hope, I, I hope it's the organization that I, that I thought I was joining back in 1993 when I, you know, when I, cause like, I mean, okay. So you're going to people and you're writing about love, like, like, how could you be so focused on hating people for what they look like or what they, you know, yeah. who they, who they love, you know, just like, it's, it's, it's crazy to me. So. But RWA does still exist, but boy, the, the this past year has, was really tumultuous for them. Well, we appreciate you for uh, for what you for the culture. We appreciate you. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier in the episode, and I want to make sure that we mention it. You said, "And the sex will be on the page," and I want to talk about sex on the page because sex on the page, sex on the page is great, and I. I just like to know like how you kind of like gain inspiration for just like different types of pairings and different types of sex. You know, some people are more dominant, some people are more loving and sweet and some are more adventurous. Like, how, like do the, do you watch other TVs and movies and they're like inspire you to certain characters for that? Or does it all just sort of come to you and you're like, Ooh, that would be a fun little moment. 
Yeah, I know. I think I think that right at the end there, you hit on it. I think because I think it all comes back to, you know, we were talking earlier about um, about writing characters as individuals. So that's really where you start. And that includes when you're writing about sex. So who are they? Who are they? You know, what what appeals to them? Because we're not we're you know, as as human beings, we don't all find the same things attractive. We don't find all find the same things sexy. Some things that somebody might find sexy, another person might find scary. And and you, what you don't want to do is you don't want to team up two people who and have one be frightened and one be or, or have to have to um have to hold back with who they are because of because of the other person's hang-ups and and um you know I think I got my most um big biggest romance and pushback from um from two characters that I didn't have, I didn't connect Sophia and Decker where everybody thought they were going to end up together because and 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 she she had been like tragically abused and he was into a little bit of the rough stuff. And, and it just was not going to like and it just like the, the idea of two people having like he would have had to. He wouldn't have like his life with her would have been missing something. And, and so so, you know, so when you when you're writing sex scenes you really just you start with who the people are you start with who they are and you know because a lot of people I always I always thought it was funny that many authors would be like well what kind of car does he drive I'm like like, really is that like if you're going to be going into that like maybe you might be thinking about you know like what positions does he like to be you know like what's what is what does he find sexy what does what does she find sexy what do they find sexy you know that type of of an approach um, and, and it's, and I think it really, it, it's all kind of organic then, you know, because you have characters who are acting true to themselves and, and, um, and so the sex scene is going to come across as really organic and, and true at the same time. You know, so you mentioned that, I, that just those specific characters, like she was horribly abused and he liked the rough stuff. Um, and I, I get that logic, the logic in what you're saying. Um, uh, so one thing I'm very vocal about on the podcast is that like a year and some change ago, I came out as kinky, kinky as fuck. Um, I started going to kink classes, kink support groups, and, you know, now I have a kink partner and, and it's fun. Um, and the one thing I found out is like, uh, that people who've gone through have had a horribly tragic, uh, past and that uh, sort of thing, um, uh, myself included, uh, find a lot of comfort in kink, right? And in the rough stuff, because, well, it, it's not actually unique to the rough stuff. It's unique to the communication that is required to participate in those things. Nothing comes as a surprise. Everything is agreed upon and talked about at length before you play in a healthy relationship, you know? So it can be, um, Bridget and I had a whole talk about face slapping when we were recording <laughs> the podcast last time. Because, you know, Bridget's like, I wouldn't want to be smacked across the face. Like, you know. Patrons, that's on patreon.com oh, forward slash romance at a glance. <laughs> but she's like, I wouldn't want to be smacked in the face. And I was like, me neither. I have a trigger. If anybody raises their hand to my face, I immediately will, mm-hmm. will recoil, right? Uh, but this dominatrix, uh, shout out to uh, Miss Michelle, she was like, she's like, I can show you a way to do it that won't trigger you, right? And I was like, really? Okay, do it. Let's do it. And she did the most sensual, like, like rubbing of the face, holding of the face, warming up, like small smacks before the harder smacks. And it was lovely. And I was like, oh my God, can I be your submissive? Like, this is amazing, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, but I find a lot of comfort and a lot of more control in my body, having had the ability to talk to my partner about exactly what I want, exactly what I don't want um, and what I want to explore. So it's just a very interesting uh, thing that you say there. Yeah, yeah, no, and I hear you. And, I, and, and, and what you have to consider, though, is that what I said was shorthand for, for the, the relationship and, and that the characters just for really sure. for each other. But yeah, so it's kind of a shorthand way of seeing it. But I, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. And, and that really makes sense. It does. I'm, I'm excited to read uh, your books. I know as soon as I read one, I'm going to read them all. <laughs> good, good. I hope you, I hope you like them. Um, you have been married for a long time. Yes. Uh, we always like to equate all these books that we read to relationship advice and 
uh, you know, like sometimes we'll read a book where maybe it's a dark romance and we're like, Ooh, this is sexy in the book. If this is happening in real life, this is a red flag. You better run. <laughs> or we'll say things like, Oh, if, you know, if he's showing up for you and the actions are there, like believe him when he says, I love you, what would you recommend, you know, a- after having been married for a long time to, you know, stay married or, or find, you know, how do you know that person was the right person for you? Any advice? Um, to, actually, you know, advice. we we kind of we kind of touched on it a bit right at the beginning of, of this conversation, where where I said that um, that 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 long term relationships, the foundation is friendship, and and so so it's, so it's one thing to love somebody, but if you can really like them too, that's a really great thing because that means <laughs> that means it just it's just um, it just makes it just makes life just so much better because your, your, your romantic partner then is your best friend. And, and, uh, so it really, uh, it really like, have you guys seen that, um, that TikTok video of the guy singing in the grocery store, we're fighting in the grocery store. Um, and I just, and there's a line in it and I, and I love you, but I don't think that I like you anymore. I just said that like, I was cracking up cause it just came to mind because it's so true. It's really, it's an awesome, it, search for it because it's really amazing. It's an amazing series of TikTok videos that are just it's like, it's a little romance novel, right? In a, in, in a TikTok song. <laughs> if, you guys, if you guys could see Suzanne, she is, uh, when I asked her about her husband and her life, she's been grinning the whole time she's been answering that question. So yeah. obviously she likes her husband. Quite I like him a lot. He's really a good guy. He's very funny. He's a very funny man. And we, we do a lot of, we, um, we co-write uh, screenplays together. And, and, um, along with our son, which is a really, which is a really interesting thing to, to do to, you know, to write, cause we write LGBTQ, um, mostly comedy. The guys really like comedy and, and, um, but we produce movies as well. So we work together closely for that. And, and, um, and they're, they're both very funny men. And, and it's, it's really awesome to have a guy in your life who just like can, can crack you up and make you laugh. It's a good thing. <laughs> For sure. Uh, is there kind of to wrap it up? Is there something that you wish, you know, in all these decades you've been getting interviewed, is there something that you wish interviewers would ask you or that you would want to talk more about that they don't ask you? No, you guys, you guys were, you guys had some good questions. We talked about some really um, kind of things that weren't, um, you know, talking point land, you know, that was, so that was a really, that was a really fun interview. I, I really appreciate that. I do want to, if I can tell you guys some of the books that I've read recently, the things that like right now I'm reading um, Alyssa Cole's No One Is Watching, really loving that. Oh, that uh, looks good. I recently read um, Alexis Hall's uh boyfriend material and um oh Farah Mashan Farah Farah Rashan's um boyfriend project oh that, I'm that's that's like my new favorite series um Kit Roca's Deal with the Devil really really good oh my god and and um Victoria Helen Stone's um Problem Child which was a sequel to Jane Doe which was which is maybe like my, those two books are like my like books to like go to during the Trump era <laughs> but, um <laughs> But yeah, we'll, I, I we'll to, make sure that we link all of those so everyone who's listening can uh, yeah. check out what you're reading for sure. Thanks. This, oh my this gosh. has been such an amazing, lovely, refreshing conversation because yeah. truthfully, I feel like nobody really likes to talk about these things in a real way um, and be afraid to maybe possibly say something wrong, you know? Um, and so it's just really nice because I feel like having these conversations so openly is what allows uh, for the conversation to be normalized everywhere in everyone's home and, and that sort of thing. And so lovely. I appreciate exactly. you. I hear you. I hear you so much. And we tiptoe around all sorts of things, especially people like me, 60 year old white ladies. And, and you know, and that whole, that whole attitude of, um, of, of being nice instead of, instead of being honest or being, or being, like, like, what is, what, what is nice? Like, what, like, don't be nice, be kind always, but be truthful and be, uh, and be in search of justice and be in search of, of equality and, and, um, and equity, you know, that that's something that we really have to be fighting for. And if, cause if, cause if we don't do it, who will, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So keep up the good work with your podcast and try to get people to talk about this. Cause it is <laughs> yeah. important. Absolutely. It's so important. Yeah, absolutely.
Um, well, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you've been doing lots of election stuff and I'm so happy that we could get you in before and, and make sure. Uh, to- yeah, I appreciate that because who knows what's going to happen after. I mean, oh my God, I mean, you know, when this- we voted, I mean, Californians, uh, we got our ballots on the 8th, I think. So we already dropped our ballots off, but um, we, and a lot of people in California have already dropped their ballots off. Um, yeah. I think yeah, we're mine's like, actually going in this week. I haven't had a moment to sit down with all the propositions. Yeah, so I just moved. People have just been telling me how to vote, but it's that's never a thing I, I've ever been about. No, so I'm like, yeah, I've been moving. We have so, like, like you, we have like 25 this year or something insane. We have so yeah. many propositions to go through. You know, have you found the website Ballotpedia? Because it has a lot of mm-hmm. um, it, it has a lot of information about any kind of uh, questions or propositions that are that and it do, it do, yeah. it does give a pretty good kind of explanation. But, yeah, uh, we're lucky it, that California mails out like a uh, like so each each prop gets like two pages, like one for one against with all the arguments and who supports what. So, yeah. which is great. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's definitely a stressful, you know, like everyone, it's a stressful time we're all living in. So we're our goal with the podcast is always just to be a place where people can come and laugh and have fun and learn and. We're, we're uh, all enjoy. in this life together. We're all in it together and just, you know, have a good time. So we appreciate, appreciate yeah. you. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to our channel to get new episodes, clips, and more. And click here to watch our previous reviews and author interviews.